Today I sit down and speak to Richard Shaky Shaw, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, head coach and owner of Shaw Mixed Martial Arts, and the host of the Shake, Rattle and Roll podcast, where Richard interviews British sporting icons and rising stars, primarily in the MMA scene. What Richard has achieved with his gym, Shaw Mixed Martial Arts, is nothing short of spectacular. Coming from very humble beginnings in the Welsh Valleys, where there has historically not been a ton of opportunity, Richard now has created a state-of-the-art facility boasting three UFC athletes and many world-class pro and amateur MMA fighters. Today's interview was a really special one for me in particular because I actually train at SMMA and Richard is my Brazilian Jiu Jitsu coach. So I've seen him work and he's someone that I really respect and it was just a big honor for me to go into topics like leadership, self-discipline, um, the self-improvement benefits of martial arts, facing your fears um, and how to grow in confidence through challenge. So uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this, this podcast. If you want to find out more about Richard or you're interested in MMA, then I highly recommend checking out his podcast, which I'll leave a link to in the description. But uh, yeah, without further ado, this is my conversation with Richard Shaky Shaw. I've, I've watched quite a few um, of your YouTube videos and you've done a lot of interviews about the MMA scene, about different fights that you've worked a part of and different fighters that you've coached. Um, but I haven't seen anywhere where you've gone into your story and, and the kind of the journey that you went on to yeah. have what is now quite a remarkable thing. Shaw Mixed Martial Arts, SMMA. You have two athletes in the UFC. Um, Three now. Three now. In the, well, okay. Three in the UFC. Um, amazing Cage Warrior pros and amateurs. And it's kind of a crazy thing because we're just like a, kind of a, in a small place in the valleys. And I, I really am super curious how you started. And maybe we can just start with your first experiences in, of martial arts in general. Like what was the first time you, you got into right. martial arts? First, first martial art I ever did was judo. Um, I was a young lad, uh, pretty, pretty, I was in primary school, so I, w- I would have been around about 10, 11 years of age. I trained for about a 12 month with a guy called Alan Holland. And uh, I'd done a couple of belts and I'd done a couple of competitions. But if I'm honest, um, I, like uh, my parents had taken me into the comps and as a young lad, I didn't really fancy it, if I'm honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just put me off and, and I stopped going, do you know what I mean? So I had about 18 months of judo as a, as a youngster. Uh, and then pretty much I didn't do anything then until I was around about 17, 18. Um, when I started working in a pub and the doorman used to run like a martial arts class up in the function room um, three nights a week. We had a, a young... Young man at the time, God rest his always passed away now, called Reese, Reese Long, who was a black belt in judo. And we had a guy called Steve Amon, who was a black belt in karate. And we just used to pick the bones out of both arts and do a bit of, bit of training and a, a little, bit of, little bit of sparring. And I'd done that for, for quite a few years, up until I was about 29 when I, when I started taking a serious then, when I joined my first ever jiu-jitsu club. So, because... I- now I see you as someone who is like really accomplished in competition. You, you still like seem to love rolling jujitsu yeah. training. So I'm kind of surprised that you didn't like the competing um, when you first started judo. I, I think it was probably a, a confidence thing. And um, just as a kid, I was more into football and stuff at that age, if I'm honest, you know, and I think it was a case of, um, being forced to go more than the wanting to go, really. Do you know what I mean? You know, not not knocking anybody for that. Parents mm-hmm. tend to take their kids to to martial arts and you know want them to do well and push them. But um, no, I just fell by the wayside the judo really after about eight, 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 eighteen months. And I I can't put my finger on. I was very very young, but I, I was a keen footballer. I used to play football and train football all the time. Um, but then you know started training with the the guys that were the doorman in the pubs, you know, when I was 18, 19 and started to get a real buzz back for it then as well. But um, I didn't really fall in love with the sport up until 
like I said, when I was 29 and I, um, I experienced my first my first ever uh, encounter with jiu-jitsu, which was a bit of a mind-blower <laughs> because I've been training what I thought were you know, a, a decent level of martial art for 10 years. And uh, I got absolutely whooped in like three minutes. I was submitted probably six, seven times by someone who trains with us at the moment, um, Steve Jane, believe oh, really? it or not. Yeah, Steve, who's one of my students now, um, I was down the ledger, local ledger centre hitting a bag and he was in there hitting a bag. And he said, oh, you still training with Reese and, and the boys? And I was like, yeah, yeah, still having a go. He said, oh, do you fancy having a grapple? And I thought, oh, I'd, I'd be okay here. And, um, Steve had been training jiu-jitsu for quite some time and just submitted me one thing. And I had no idea of what it was, you know. When we were training the judo, it was, we were doing a lot of throws and a lot of clinch work. We do some pad work and, and you know, kickboxing, sparring. But there was, there was no understanding of the grappling you know, the actual mm. jiu-jitsu side of it. So it was a real eye-opener for me. And that sensation where you feel like you're drowning, you know, you can't breathe, you, you're trying to use strength. Um, and it, it shocked the life out of me, you know. I asked him where he'd been doing it, and he, he gave me the name of the club he was training at, which was um, Falcons Martial Arts at the time. So uh, I rocked up there one day on my own the following week. Mm-hmm. Turned up, the instructor said to me, well, there's, there's no technique today, it's just sparring. And I looked around the room, there was probably half a dozen men there and the rest were all like young lads 13 14 15 i thought i'll be i'll be all right <laughs> and i got absolutely smashed i got submitted numerous times by 14 15 16 year old kids you know now you can walk away from that situation and think i'm not going back there i'll, mm. I'll go back to what i've been doing for the last 10 years or you can think do you know what i need to learn this and it, it blew my mind how these kids who were like three four stone lighter than me many many years younger were able to, you know, sweep me, submit me, um, be able to escape from underneath, be able to pin me on my back and I couldn't move, you know. So that was my introduction. And within within a couple of weeks, I was training five nights a week and driving, driving all around the country trying to learn the art. So that was my real introduction into martial arts. Mm. So, it's, yeah, so you were training, like, you you were familiar with martial arts for about 10 years before you had that encounter with jiu-jitsu. yeah. yeah. And it sounds like you, it was quite a humbling experience. Very humbling. And, I, and I'd watched the UFC with, um, with Roy Casey, you know, um, turning up in his gi and submitting everybody. Mm. But still, I didn't get a real understanding of it. I thought it was more, you know, he was a judoka rather than a jiu-jitsu player when, when I was watching the videos. But it was an absolute shock. Um, one of the kids there at the time is in the UFC now, Joe Duffy. Mm-hmm. Joe must have been, I don't know, 14, 15 years of age, I'm guessing. And... Uh, he, he submitted me numerous times in a four-minute run. It was it was mind blowing to be honest. Wow, because like they say with jujitsu, it's it's one of those sports <laughs> or oh, martial arts with one of the highest turnover rates. A lot of people apparently quit. Um, what do you think made you stick stick to it? Not only just to to get a decent level, but to go all the way to black belt. I was. I think it's a fascination and a very. Um, I fixate on things as well, you know, as a person, my, my personality. <clears throat> so what, 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 what I found is it's never ending. It was always something else to learn, something else to learn. You'd get caught in something. You'd want to learn that. You'd watch a video. Um, I was competing all the time. So sometimes, you know, I, I'd be doing really, really well in competition. Then all of a sudden, boof, I'd, I'd come up against an opponent who would submit me with something. And I'd fixate on that. And I'd try and get, you know... The internet wasn't around back in the early days, so I try and get videos and magazines and try and understand and work out what what happened. But I, I think it's just one of those things that I love. I enjoy doing it, and it's the same as any aspect in life. I think if you enjoy doing something in life, um, you know, it's not a hobby, it's not a chore, it's something you look forward to do. You know, and mm-hmm. even though at my age, I, I still look forward to training every night. So um, I still enjoy the the grappling and, and and jumping in with the young lads and seeing if the old fox can catch them with the with your thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so you you did a lot of competition was that yeah. something that was because like as you know i've only i've competed a couple of times not many would you say that competing was something that really helped you yeah and i mean i, I was never you know when i started back in you know i i, I wasn't you know some local hard nut or anything you know i was a, a young 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 lad with a young family that was uh that was working and, and, and doing discos on the weekends, you know, when some like local bouncer went. and uh, I was six weeks into training um, at, at Falcons when the instructor said, 
there's a competition coming up. Oh, sorry, it was about four weeks into training it was. There's a competition in two weeks. It's a novice jiu-jitsu tournament. And it's not Brazilian jiu-jitsu like it was now. It was traditional jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. So I put my name in the hat. And um, I went up there. It was like after six weeks of training. And I actually won the tournament. It was for competitors wow. of 12 months and under. So I had three three bouts on the day. And when I when I arrived there, I, a terrifying experience. My nerves, you know, um, stress through the roof. But then after one, one, one bout, it was like, Oh, hang on, that wasn't too bad. Then after winning and getting to the final, and it was just that sort of mentality then of, hang on, we're not made of glass. We don't break so easy. This this isn't as bad as you think. So um, I just started then competing as much as I could, really. You know what I mean? Um, whether it be a traditional sport jiu-jitsu tournament, which was, um, if I explain that to people, it was you wear your gi, you'd wear similar sort of gloves to, to MMA gloves, you'd wear shin guards, and it was semi-contact striking, so you could only like back fist to the head, um, control kick to the head. You could let it go a little bit to the body. Um, there was takedowns. If you got somebody down, you had a minute to work on the ground, and they'd stand you back up. It was quite an exhausting. I say to everybody, everybody ought to try it. It's a tough old format, you know. Um, but I, I was, you know, doing a lot of those. I, I was British champion. Um, I went to the World Championships in 2007, and... Uh, took the gold medal in the world championships in Germany back back in those days, uh, but I was also doing grappling and then I started um, after jujitsu for about a year and a half. I started doing a bit more, a bit more with the MMA then, and you know got fixated on that a little bit as well. That's really I think quite encouraging to people. Like you were nervous for your first jujitsu tournament, and then eventually you just got into your stride so that you weren't so vulnerable and ended it's, up it's, the, it's the same as anything the more you do something the more familiar it becomes um I, i'm i'm a big of you know i think all clubs should encourage your students to compete and it's not for everybody but if you want to get a black belt from myself mm-hmm. you have to compete i'm not expecting you to be british champion i'm not expecting you to be a world champion i'm not even expecting you to win gold medals but what i do want you to do is get out of that comfort zone and uh and test yourself because in the gym so for example myself and you and john we're familiar with each other i know what you know you've got a great guard a good butterfly you're very flexible so straight away when we start rolling i know what your strong points are Mm. you as well will know what my strong points are and sometimes it can be a little bit of well with expectation within the grapple Mm-hmm. When you go into a competition, you've no idea on this guy's background. It's a bit, bit easier now with YouTube and Facebook and everybody loves to bloody put everything all over social media. But, you know, back in those days, it was a case of, right, you're coming up against somebody, you've no understanding of what they're good at or what they're poor at. And that's that's a real challenge then, you know. Um, and that's when your adrenaline kicks in, your nerves kick in. Um, and hence why, you know, it's a martial art at the end of the day. And I, I just think that to get a black belt in any martial arts, you've got to have some experience of confrontation and whether that's through a controlled environment of, um, of a competition, great. It's, you know, nobody's getting hurt. It's fantastic. But I think it's key that everybody competes. Just get used to that nerves. And, you know, you never know. One day on the street, you might have that adrenaline dump and all your training in the world goes out the window. Whereas I think competition prepares you a little bit better for that. You know, once the adrenaline kicks in, it's something that your body's familiar with from competition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've I've I couldn't believe the the difference in my body when I competed versus just rolling in the gym, um, and I I learned so much even in like one minute, just like yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I need to do this 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 differently. So it's really really I can see the value of competing. And also you're using your muscles at 100% force as well. In it, whereas sometimes in the gym you can be a bit relaxed because if you pass my guard, we're not scoring points. Mm. But in in a competition it's key that I don't allow you to pass guard. I don't allow you to get mount because you can just sit there. Whereas in the gym, everybody's flow, flowing and, and, and rolling around. Um, I, I, I remember saying to somebody, I'd done a, an MMA bout once. And it was only a no head shot. And it was a one five minute round. And I ate for like three days. Yet, you know, mm. leading up to that for six weeks, we, we were sparring for an hour a day. Wow. But, you know, the, the, the intensity of a competition bout is a lot different to what you're going to get in the gym. Yeah. Okay, so you so so far in the, in the story, you you went to uh, you started training uh, jujitsu, typical like yeah. Brazilian jujitsu, and very soon you started training five days a week. What happened after that? After you got a competent level in jujitsu and started competing? So 
I was competing regular. I started fighting MMA um, back in those days. You know, it's it's not like today where you've got shows all, all over the country in a really good level. It was um, the first was was amateur. It was called then. There was no headshots. It was shin guards, four ounce gloves. Fought on mats, ne- never in a cage or in a ring. You know. Um, and there was two key competitions in the UK. One was grappling strike in Wales, and one was the combat sport open trials. Um, and it was like a league. So you'd turn up, you'd have two fights, you'd score three points for a win, two points for a draw, one point for a loss. And the top four competitors in each weight division would get called back at the end of the year then to fight for the fight for the title. So I started some of that. Then it was... Um, I progressed then on the what they, they called back in those days semi-pro rules which was four ounce gloves, headshots standing, but no, no ground and pound to the head on the, on the floor. Um, and then obviously you had your, your professional rules, but you know, it was a, a totally different dynamic back then. I mean, today you've got your safe MMA, you've got your brain scans, you've got doctors, you've got really stringent rules around weight, uh, being on weight and all these things and qualified doctors ringside and referees that have been around and done courses. Like you would turn up for a fight back when I was competing and, your opponent would turn up 3k overweight and it'd be, oh yeah, you're happy with that, yeah, and you was right, that's going, you was earning no money, your, your, your medical was a St. John's ambulance guy, just like looking in your eyes, checking your your heart rate and say, yeah, you're fine, you're good to go. Um, so it was, you know, it was, it, it, it was tough back in those days, but it was raw and it, but, you know, it was new. Mm. It was something you've never done before and I really enjoyed it, you know. You couldn't get an MMA kit unless you, you ordered it from America or um, off MMA Universe was a website which came out then in the UK, you know, but a lot different, you know, we, we myself in particular in Wales, I, I, I'd like to think that people appreciate how hard I work to get a level of MMA events where it's a real positive for everybody competing on it, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's done the right way. But yeah, that's what I've done. I carried on with jiu-jitsu. Um, around, around 2007, then I entered the World Martial Arts Championships, which is in Germany. I went out there, took a silver medal in the grappling division, and I took a gold medal in the sport jiu-jitsu division. And then not so long after I came back from there, you know, um, I decided to open up my own club. And in 2008, that's when Clearly Combat, you know, which was our previous name, that's when we were formed. I want to go go into the MMA, the early MMA uh, stuff. So there are now MMA, UFC, really popular um, there are so many reasons to get into it. You, you know, the money yeah. is better. There's more celebrity involved, but you were doing it when it was before that time and yeah. maybe safety, as you said, wasn't like super yeah. well regulated. So what was the, like for me, MMA is scary enough as it is, but it sounds like it was way scarier back then. So like, what was the, yeah. the main reason you did it? I, I think, again, it was just a, a new challenge. Um, I used to, you know, do really well in the gym against lads that were a bit more experienced than me. And, you know, I'm one of them people that's always enjoyed a challenge. So the challenge here for me was, again, because it wasn't a nat- what I would call a natural fighter, you know, somebody who's been brought up fighting on the streets or whatever. I just found it amazing how this lad from Lady could turn up and, 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 and for want of a better turn, have it out with some real rough, tough, Mm. individuals and come out on top for the majority of the time, you know, so I, again, I think it's, it, I suppose the adrenaline, the, I, I said, well, with the adrenaline buzz I would get off it is better than any narcotic that somebody would take. That was my drug of choice was going and, and competing in grappling or competing in MMA. Um, and even if I'd given a good account, if I lost even, if, as long as I'd given a good account, I'd still have a good buzz about myself, you know, um, and I'm probably just chasing that adrenaline all the time, that uh, that excitement, I suppose, for the day, you know. And uh, back then, you know, you're getting your name in the newspaper. Is it? Like I said, mm. there was no social media. And, um, all your fights were put on a VHS video. You could buy the VHS video off uh, off the organiser. But no, I just, and I just, you know, I used to have a bit of a buzz off being the only one in the area that was doing it. You know, there were many of us doing it. Um, Dal James is one of my black belts, was another one. He, he was side by side with me as we were doing this, this journey even back in those days. Wow. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's super cool. And what you've just made me think as well as martial arts is one of the, the few kind of activities that you can do that really changes you for the better. Yeah. Like your identity actually shifts. Um, like you were seeing yourself differently as you were competing. Spot um, on. Yeah. 
So uh, just before we get into the, the uh, you starting your gym, how would you say that martial arts and training martial arts has, has changed you and how you see yourself? For me, the biggest one was confidence. I, I used to be somebody who was afraid of confrontation, you know, um, not, not necessarily physical, even, even, even verbally, you know. Um, you know, I had a t- tough old upbringing, and I suppose that played a part on, on, on me being a little bit nervous at times, you know, with the way that I was brought up. But it just turned, it changed me. And I, and I, I say this to everybody, it's not about, you know, I had the skills now where I'd be comfortable of facing any man, you know, in a one-to-one confrontation on the street. Yet you can count on one hand how many times I've ever had to have a, a physical fight in my 48 years mm. in a street environment. Because what it does, it gives you that confidence to be able to verbalize things then because you know you've got the physical attributes to back something up. Sometimes, you know, just by using your tongue, you can walk, you know, work your way out of a certain situation. Um, it made me more confident as a person. I, was, I became more relaxed, I think, as well. I wasn't so highly strung because, again, that confidence follows you around and it made me so much more humble. Well, you know, what the eye-opener for me was is that you, you'd walk in a pub back in the day and you'd think the biggest fella over there is probably the toughest kid in the, the, the pub. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you get involved in martial arts, and I, I thought like the, the first experience when I walked into this room full of kids and they've all submitted me, I think you'd have the shock of your life if you picked on the wrong person, you know? And I, and I think everybody should have a taste of it because there's a lot of kids that I work with in, in, in my role as a, a behavior manager in school where oh, I just knock them out, I do this and I do that if they have a little bit of experience of going into a martial arts club, forced to do it for six weeks. And also I think it would humble them and bring them out and that would, that would impact on their personal life as well, as much as they wouldn't be fighting on the streets it's because you just do not know who you're picking on, you know, mm-hmm. you know yourself, John, we got some small lads in our gym that are absolute killers that would mm-hmm. absolutely ruin an evening for somebody if they, if the wrong person picked on them, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, but for me, it just built me, I think as a person, a, a, a much more relaxed, a lot more confident, and like I said, not just confident in, in, in fighting, but just confident in, in, in all walks of life, you know, the way I carry myself, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I love that. Totally agree. I uh, Since I've been training um, with you for almost a year and a half now, like the idea of, of conflict is like, I don't like, I don't want to go there, you know, like it's no, you don't, because the person who typically starts the, the street fight, they don't really know what true um real fighting is you know when it's yeah. done at, a, at a high level so yeah it's kind of like the last thing that i'd want to do now um, thing is as well mate right you, you, there's a no-win situation you know I, I won't name names but i i knew an accomplished martial artist that was working on the door um was challenged challenged and forced into a physical altercation and then ended up having to, you know, I think it was 18 months in prison mm. because when he went to court, they pinged, you know, oh, you're a martial, you're an MMA fighter, you're a black belt in judo. Um, were you trying to show off in front of the pub? You know, it could sometimes do you a disservice having a good martial arts background as well, you know, particularly yeah. in the, on the legal side of things. But um, I, I always say to everybody, Try and walk away from the situation. Many a time I've rung somebody the following morning when, when I was working in the pubs and clubs and I have said, right, you know, you had enough to say last night. Do you want to meet up and we can have a conversation? And in the cold light of the day and when they've done a little bit of homework on who you are and what you actually do, um, it's a totally different dynamic than when you're trying. So try and avoid it in the heat of the moment. It's, it's not a sign of weakness walking away, is it? Do you know what I mean? It's, it's a common sense approach to today's day and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when you decided to start your own uh, gym, your own club, what, what did that look like? Um, right. So I, I had a look around and I found um, uh, there was a nightclub were offering a, a, a little cellar out for, for hire. And it was eight meters long, four meters wide. It was a room hmm. underneath a nightclub and the toilets we used were the nightclub toilets. So they weren't the most clean. We had a, a key to get in to use those. So I never had no money at the time. I was, you know, I was working in a factory. Uh, so I, I took out a credit card on, it was an egg credit card, 1200 quid interest free over 12 months. So I purchased some mats, purchased some mitts um, and I paid that back then over 12 months interest free. And we laid out eight meters by four meters. So it's, you know, not very big, it's the same size as somebody's, some people's front room kitchen diner, you know? Mm. Um, it started off with 12 of us training there and then just over a period of time, 
you know, more and more people started dropping in. We were up to about 25, 30 people and the room just wasn't big enough. So that was our first introduction. I got some photos somewhere. I'll have to put them online because it was a dingy, dark little hall. And uh, I tried to think it was still there. Daryl started, Marshman, uh, Martin McDonough, Chris Tetley was training there. Big Jack Evans. I don't think, I don't think there's anybody else from originally that was in that cell. Like Edwards and I came to me then, like after I moved a 12 month down to a, a unit. Then we moved to a unit where, where the new gym is now. There's mm -hmm. a small unit on the very end as you come through the double gates. I had that for 12 months. And then obviously we took the gym over in Blyton and we were there then for about eight, nine years. What sort of uh, training were you doing in the in the early days? What sort of um, schedule? Very similar to what we're doing now. We'd have um, a set grappling night, a set kickboxing night, a set MMA night, um, and a set open mat. So uh, this the, the format was the same, but obviously the level of ability and um, the level of technique. When when we first went there, it was traditional jujitsu, kickboxing, a little bit of judo and grappling then while I was there then that's when um, I approached a gentleman called Dave Coase from the Combat Academy about could we affiliate with them so that I could get through my Brazilian Jiu Jitsu um, grades and compete in a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu environment then so that was around about 2008 um, just before that I did get my blue belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu if I, if I go back a little bit in 2004 right uh, I was training traditional jiu-jitsu, went up, and Royce Gracie came to the UK and done a seminar in Norwich. Mm. I think, no, no, Norwich. I think, yeah, it was Norwich, a great Yarmouth. I went to two. And for me, it was like, Christ, after training martial arts and watching these UFC videos, it was like a football again, a chance to train with David Beckham in my mind. So yeah. a couple of us drove up to, to Great Yarmouth. And it was in a basketball court, like a little uh, youth. And I thought, bloody, I, I was expecting like 200 people to turn up, you know, how deluded we were that you thought everybody was into martial arts. This room turns up, and I think at the very, very maximum, it must have been 25, 30 people there had attended the seminar. So Royce done the seminar, done the teaching, and then uh, everybody sparred. And how it worked was that if you won, if you won, you stayed in, mm -hmm. and if you lost, you sat on the side. And it got to the point where myself and my brother-in-law were down to the last four. It was me and my brother-in-law, the instructor for Roy Spacey Norwich, who was a Purtle Belt, um, and another lad who was a Purtle Belt. And as we got to the last four, he, he cut it dead. And um, I was awarded my Blue Belt off ice on that day. Wow. You know, he's got a bit of a reputation of giving and giving Blue Belts away. You know, it was a bit of a common common joke. Around. But uh, for me... Uh, it was it was it was amazing for me at two thousand you know to 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 get a blue belt off Royce Gracie. I thought it was his knees, you know. So That's incredible. When, yeah. So when I when I joined Dave in two thousand and eight, I was already um a blue belt because that, that follows you through, you know, regardless of what instructor gives you the belt, you you, you carry that through with your clubs. And that's when my real jujitsu journey started there and I started competing regular. I was late thirties then, but I was still competing in the adult division and Again, I won um, a blue belt. I won Welsh Open a couple of times, um, Hedyford Open several times. I won, um, I took a silver medal in the British Open, but then a blue belt. I won the, uh, oh, what was it called? It was, like, it was like the Europeans. I can't remember what it was called now. Um, but it's a big event down in the O2 in, in London, and I, and I took a gold medal in that. And then I went on to Puerto Belt. It was two years at Puerto Belt. And I'm a brown belt. I think it was three and a three and a half years of brown before I got my black. And mm. you know, at every belt level, I competed and won the British Open several times as well. So um, wow. I'm proud of that fact, you know, as well. So from and when people say to me about, um, oh, you 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 know, you're one of the toughest people to get a belt off. I'm a blue belt in 2004. I'm a black belt in 2015. And this, I was a person that would train it five nights a week. Um, and, and competing once a month minimum, you know, oh. so, you know, I've set the standard and that's the standard, you know, when you get a black belt off me, it'll be, you know, you'll know it's a well-deserved black belt. You'd be, I'd be comfortable for anyone I wore a black belt to go and train in any gym in the UK and, and be more than comfortable. 
yeah wow competing so super regularly and still 11 year journey that's, yeah, that's yeah incredible um i i think that's one of the reasons i actually was drawn to jujitsu brazilian jujitsu is because it's notoriously difficult to get a black belt like it means so much to actually eventually get there if it was something that was handed out in a few weeks, I don't think I'd be like, you know, I, I like the challenge. Which is the case with a lot of martial arts, isn't it? You know, you, yeah. you've got kickboxing clubs where you can get a black belt in two to three years, some traditional jujitsu clubs, you know. Um, and it's just, all, all you're doing is you're taking this money off these people and filling them with a false sense of security, you know. We, we've had numerous black belts of different arts come to our gym. Uh, and get absolutely screwed by white belts because you know they've not been they've not been learning a real art you know and I don't mean that with any disrespect there's a place for all martial arts you know mm. everybody's different they've got, but as for I, I'm a real reality based person you know I've got a black belt in combat jiu jitsu a black belt in traditional um, tai jitsu tai jiu jitsu which is all around um, street self defense as well and I've implemented a lot of that into my Brazilian jiu jitsu schedule as a a show MMA but Sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with a bad situation. And some of these people are going to get hurt because they've been set up to fail. You know, what they think works in the gym and in the traditional jiu-jitsu dojo in, in a controlled environment with no real sparring, you know, it's going to be a real eye-opener. At least with us guys. I mean, even the, the guys that are just doing purely jiu-jitsu, no striking at all, they still know what it's like to actually grapple and hold on to people and get position and try and subdue uh, an opponent that's going 100 percent you know that's not the case in a lot of the traditional martial arts when you uh, coach us and your students in jiu-jitsu <coughs> obviously you have such a big range of students you have like people who are brand new white belts and then you have professional mma athletes is it hard to kind of uh, cater to everyone or do you teach a style that fits no what, what uh, you know what you'll find is that I'll try to spend four to six weeks in an area. So that might be guard passing. Yeah. Um, and as, I'll always start the first week with the very, very basic ones, which is suitable for everybody. And then try and progress it. Same as we work arm bars from guard. We may work um, sweeps from guard. Uh, and it'll be a four to six week process. Um, I've been at gyms before where uh, they, they split the belts. So they, like, you, you browns and blacks go and train over there and purples and blues over there. And I, I don't think that works because you may turn up as a white belt and your mate might be a purple belt and also then pulling you apart. You've come mm. in for so, social reasons as well as training. And a lot of people, I think, well, I, I'd like to train with my friend, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's, that makes you more comfortable when you're learning. You, you're more comfortable with somebody you're familiar with if you, you, you're trying to learn a technique. I think if you get everybody together, is, is, in jiu-jitsu, people get a little bit thinking the black belt will do something phenomenal compared to the white belt. It's not. It's just the black belt does the basics of it in, a, in a much better detail. Mm. So everything we teach as a, as, a, as a program, it's the same for every belt level. It's just delivered in sparring with detail at the higher belt end. Does that make sense? You know, yeah, it, that makes sense. It, it, it's like a marathon runner. If I went off and done a marathon now, it's going to take me probably 10 hours to finish it. But if I did it day in, day out, week in, week out for the next eight, nine years, my level of ability at the end of that period, still doing the same length of distance is going to be much more, uh, much more detailed, much more accomplished, isn't it? And that's the same with anything. I think same as martial arts. I still enjoy going over just basic guard passes because I've got higher belt levels there and they haven't done it for so long and they can't do it. Mm. So you need that refresher constantly. And, you know, you can go to some gyms and they will teach you some um, mind-blowing things. It looks great, you know. Oh, God, that looked flashy and that was really wicked. Did you see how they set that up? But when it comes to it, you've got to deliver that in a proper competition. Like, I'm a great believer in solid solid basics, solid foundations. Um, the fundamentals, if you do the fundamentals really well, you, you'll have a really successful career in jiu-jitsu. I mean, look at, look at Roger Gracie. Mm-hmm. Roger Grace is arguably the, the, one of the most successful of all time. What does he do? Clinch, take down, mount, collar choke. Clinch, yeah. take down, mount, collar choke. Yeah. Or it could be if he hits his back, sweep, mount, collar choke. Hits his back, arm bar. It, there's nothing snazzy. And, and don't get me wrong, he can do, he can do the full. You know, if, if you do a worm guard or um, 
work from inverted. He, he can do it all. But what he does, he does the fundamentals absolutely brilliantly. And that's why he's so successful. And we're an MME club as well, see, John. So mm-hmm. my approach is always a little bit different to probably a pure jiu-jitsu club. You know, um, there's some positions where I'll teach so you know to get out of it, but it's not something I would uh, I would push my, my students into into being a go-to, particularly if they if they've got um, aspirations of fighting MMA because it, it creates bad habits. Yeah. Okay. Get that. Yeah, I really like the idea of. Um... Roger Gracie is as a as a great example of someone who just does the basics in this like mind blowing way. It's like yeah. don't they say like invisible jujitsu? It's like yeah, yeah, spot stuff, on, spot stuff on. you can't see. So one of the things I wanted to ask you is I'm I'm kind of I've I've trained a, a couple of other gyms um, doing a different mix of martial arts over the years. What I find really impressive about your gym is that you have such a high retention rate. Like the same yeah. people have been there year after year after year. It's like a family, basically. What do you think it is that, that keeps people together in your gym? I, I just think it, it, you've just said the word that it's a family spirit there. I think that um, when you come there, I give the person who's been there six weeks as much time as the person who's been there six years. Hence why I teach every class. So even when we've got a fight camp going on, I'll, I'll make sure that I'm with the general class, even if there's a fight, a fight camp going on on, a, on another part of the gym. And the reason behind that is everybody's as important as everybody in, in, in my mind. So there's nothing worse is it than turning up, you've got your little clicks. I've been there again, you know, with different clubs. And, and the, I, I like to think my experience in being a, a competitor and a student in martial arts has led to me putting these things in place as, as a coach because mm-hmm. I've tried weighing out little things that would have niggled me when I was the person paying my money to come and, to come and learn. I try, I've tried to avoid that at all costs, you know. Um, you'd be pretty peed off, I'm guessing, if you were turning up every week and I had one of the purple belts or one of the blue belts taking a class and I was on the side dealing with the higher level belts. You, you would, wouldn't you? you know? Probably. But that goes on so often in so many of the gyms around the country. And what I like to think as well, you know, it's a big deal. When you walk through that door, and I've been there myself, it's nerve-wracking. You know, we have guys turn up that have um, no experience in martial arts. They've turned up on their own. They haven't come with a friend. It's important that we embed them into the team and, uh, and let them know that this is not a bunch of lunatics all knocking the living daylights out of each other. It's, it, we've got to walk to life. Another thing which I think has worked is, is that um, we've got firemen training there. We've got nurses training there. We've got school teachers training there. We've got builders training there. We, we've got people that's been to prison training there. We've got people that's never been in trouble in their life training. We've got full-time professional USC athletes. We've got 50-year-old men that just want to come for two days a week and do some jiu-jitsu. Yet we're all on that mat. And I think that's what's created such a, a unique environment. How many people can say, do you know what? I went to jiu-jitsu today. I rode with three guys from UFC. Yeah. Yeah? How many white belts can go, do you know what? I got a, I got a role today with... Um, Jack Shaw, world champion at Cage Warriors in the USA. I got a role with Richard Shaw, who's a BGG black belt, been training for 25 plus years. Yeah, they just allowed me to come and roll with them. Um, and as an instructor, what you know, as you said earlier on in the, in the podcast, I think it's important that I do continue to roll. And I'm getting older, and it's not as easy for me now as what it was. My knees are bad, I've got bad elbows now. Some days, I always say, Monday I'm great, Tuesday I fault, or Wednesday I'm struggling, Thursday I'm dying. Friday, I'm ready for the weekend because I need that rest. But I still put myself through it because it's key for me. If I'm going to sit the likes of you, you need to go and compete. You need to be sparring regular. You need to be training four days a week when you've got a competition coming up. No one in that gym can ever go, well, what do you know about it? I go, well, I, I do it. I'm 48 years of age and I'm still on that mat every day and I've got a competition coming up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I try to lead by example as well a lot, you know. And um, as, as for the family environment, I just feel that, We've got some a wide mix of characters there, you know, and it is like a family. You know, you've got your mad uncle, you've got the son with ADHD Edwards, for example. You've got the big brother who's all his nails, Marshman. You've got the quiet kid who can beat everybody up in the room, Jack Shaw. So it's such a wide variety of um, personalities and, and characters there. And I think that's why it works. I think you can walk in that gym from any walk of life and there'll be somebody you'll be able to relate to. And I think that's what's helped us retain it and I think also as well the fact that I'm here every night like if you don't train for a couple of weeks I'll be the first to pick up you know pick the, the phone up and mess you go why haven't you been training you know I'm on people's cases a lot and that's not from myself point of view. it's just if I see somebody's doing well at something it's a shame for them to, 
they walk away. If I had a pound for everyone, the Scotland blue belt and walked away from the sport, and then they should be looking at, you know, Jamie Law and Daryl and, and some of the higher brown belts and thinking, oh, that should be me now if I'd stick at it. You know, it's a tough sport. People say jujitsu for everyone. It's not for everyone. And I don't, I don't believe that for a minute because you've got to be dedicated. You've got to be willing to get out of the house on a cold, rainy November Wednesday evening when you've just finished a 10-hour shift in work and you think, I've got to go there for an hour and a half. But when you arrive there, the atmosphere takes over and you really enjoy it. It's, that, it's getting that mental capacity to think, let's break through our barrier and still turn up for training. And that's, that's where the, the, great, the great students filter off from the OK students because you'll have some students who will be blue belts for the rest of their lives and you'll have some that will just progress and it's a long old journey. But when you get the black belt, it's, you look back and it's like, do you know what? No one will ever take that from me and no one will ever say it was done easy. Yeah, and it sounds like you you don't ask people to do what you wouldn't do. Like you, your own jujitsu journey has been competing, like you said, and you you know so you expect people to compete. And you told me before that you've had you've had some injuries and you kept showing up and worked around the injuries. I I had um, I dislocated my leg and I was in a cast for six weeks and I didn't make, didn't miss in on my leg and I didn't miss a day's training. You just work around things. Um, I had a really really bad knee injury. Um, where I tore the meniscus and for like 12 months, it was really, really bad. And all I worked from was going on my back and working side control. And now I got the reputation of the gym of being the person who will give you side because I can turn you over and come around and north south everybody. And that, that's not saying I was a natural at all, all. That's come over the last two, two, three years, maybe where injuries have meant about work. Like when I was, I was fit and fit and healthy, I, I was a good guard player. I triangle everybody, you know, every competition I'd pull out a couple of triangles um, I could retain guard. No one would ever score a guard pass on me. Now I've, I've, I've got to open up because, you know, even somebody like you was, was a favourite small me, if you put pressure on my knee, my knee, will, my knee will pop out. So I've got to open my guard, allow the pass and work from different positions, which is great in the gym because it's not a scoring format for competition. But this is why I've been waiting for this operation, which has been cancelled again now because of the bloody coronavirus, so that I can get back into competition um, and, and look at... I don't want to enter a competition... And lose thinking, do you know what? If my knee was okay, they would never pass that guard. Or if I lose, I lose. I've lost plenty, plenty of times in, in the 20 years I've been doing this sport. And I've got no ego and I take it and I take it as a learner. But it would kill me to think I've lost that because of the injury. I couldn't, couldn't retain guard. Or this kid have beat me. He's not as good as me. But because of the injuries, I've had to, uh, I've had to allow the pass or I've had to allow a score of some sort. But, you know. Once, when, once I can get this knee op done, I'll start doing a bit more competition, even at my age. So, you know, again, people can't uh, ever point the finger and say, well, what have you done? Because I've done it all. <laughs> Setting the bar high. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to uh, you opening the gym, uh, you, you then, you, so you had the really small place and then you transferred to somewhere a bit, bit bigger. Bit bigger. We had a boxing ring in there. Um, and I think we had 10, about 60, 70 square meters of rolling area. Uh, and that, and again, a bit of a wrestling wall we built in there. And, and that's where as well. We produced um, some really good fighters there. Obviously, Marshman, Chris Edwards, Martin McDonough. Um, there was a lad, Anthony Johnson, that came up from Cardiff and trained me. He was a really good high level judo boy, but he, he'd done really well at pro when he, when he was fighting. Um, he won, won the armor title and uh, would have would have fought a bit longer, but he had trouble with his hands. They were breaking all the time. Every fight, he's a family man. He's got to look at. You know, he's got a job, so he had a he had a call every day. But some of the best fighters we got, you know, Chris Tett, he's come through the door um, early on when we moved to the new place. Edwards was there. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the more high profile. Ryan Phelps is a kid that you wouldn't you wouldn't remember, but was a a, a good pro for me. I've seen so many come and go, mate. It's incredible. Um, and we've had some real athletes there, which are really good level fighters. But, you know, situations change. Their the girlfriends um, end up pregnant and they've got to work extra hours because they've got to provide for a baby and the dynamics of their life change, you know. So it's one of these sports that it is a young, you know, the MMA in particular, if you want to be really successful, it's a young man's sport where you've got no ties to anything and you can plow your entire life into it, you know. Different when you get the UFC a little bit, you can have your family and, and your house and because you've got the finances there to do it. But 
you know, it's difficult to look after a family when you're earning 500 quid a fight as you're working your way up through the pro ranks. So, so to, to make it in, in an early MMA career, are you saying that you've got to really dedicate pretty much everything to it? You can't have distractions? Yeah, I think so. I, particularly in today, you know, you, you look at some, some of the amateurs. Uh, you, look, you look at our gym. Um, Jack Tech is a, a, a great example. You know, he has his first pro fight yet, but that's a lad that was fighting amateur and had a really good record, went to the IMAS, you know, lost to the eventual winner by point. But he's training like a pro, you know. Mm-hmm. It, 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 same as Oban before he went pro, they were training like pros at amateur now. So the, the level and, and the effort put in by these, these young athletes is so high, you know, you can't do it as a, a hobby. When I was fighting, there was kids that were training, up, training three nights a week and having a fight on the weekend. You know, you couldn't do that now. You get annihilated in less than a minute. You know, the, the level has changed. In such a short space of time, um, I'm going to go back to say, we well, in 2020, 10 years, even even eight years ago, you know, people competing and doing okay that wouldn't last a minute with some of the amateurs have got there now. You know, so the, the level has really, really changed. And yet, you do need to be disciplined. At the end of the day, what, what is MMA? It's two, two, two individuals having a competitive fight with some rules. And the object, the, the objective is to knock that person even rendered unconscious strangle them unconscious or break a limb. It's, when, that, when that cage door shuts and that's the reality, right, I'm going to face somebody now, there's three things he's going to try and do. He's going to try and knock me out, choke me out, or break something, break one of my body parts. It's, it's a tough old environment to, to, to make a living in, you know? Um, and it's not for everybody. You've got to be a certain mental. And mental strength is key. I've had some of the best athletes in the world come through that are really, really talented lads. But they haven't got that capacity to train hard for 10 weeks and give up drinking drugs. They haven't got that capacity to train up five nights a week, even if they've had to work hard and do a 10-hour shift. You know, me- mentally, you've got to be on it now as much as physically. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about Jack Shaw. Uh, obviously, you are Jack's coach and he's also your son. Um, I've watched... Uh, as many of his fights as I've, I could watch on, on YouTube and stuff. And I don't think I've ever seen him look in trouble. Like I just, every scramble, he comes out like winning the scramble. Uh, what I've heard you in the documentary, there's a documentary made on him, like a, a mini yeah. documentary that I'll, I'll link to. Um, and you said something like he, he mixes it all the arts together yeah. in a way that yeah. kind of is better than any one of them. He's, he, he's what you call a new breed, you know, um, likes of him, Jack Tucker, Oban, Jordan Peake, Josh Reed. These are not guys that have, um, say, for example, got a black belt in one art, come and start to do an MMA. They've done MMA from day dot. So in the documentary, the wording is there's better strikers out there, there's better wrestlers and there's better grapplers in pure form in each, in, in, in each set but there's not many put it together the way that he does, you know? Uh, and that's why I think now MMA is a, a martial art in itself, you know? Um, it's mixed martial arts, it's a mix of all arts, but it, it has become a, a martial art form, in, on a, you know, with its own identity, I believe, you know, so. Yeah, like mixing, striking with wrestling completely changes both of them. It, right? it is, I mean, um, you can have some world-class boxing coaching, but then you've got to adjust it slightly for the MMA because the, the you've got to be uh, wary of being kicked on your league leg or a single leg takedown. Same with Muay Thai. You know, you, you can learn all the facets of Muay Thai, but there's certain things you wouldn't bring into a, an MMA fight because of the fear of getting took down. Same with grappling. You know, if me and you're having a pure grapple, you may feel comfortable going inverted on me and rolling underneath me for a leg lock. And if I stole out that position, nobody's getting it. But if I stole out that position, I can thump you in the face coming from a downward motion, you know. So you've got to learn every art in its purity. This is what, this is my belief, that mm-hmm. you learn boxing, you don't you don't strip anything up, you learn the whole of boxing. You learn the whole of Muay Thai, you learn the whole of wrestling, you learn the whole of grappling, and then you've put that together and you just strip out the parts which don't work for MMA. If someone uh, is listening to this and they maybe they, they haven't trained MMA and they, they want to start training MMA, what do you think they should, like, in what order should they put their, the emphasis on? You know, what should they spend the most time on? Um, I, I think jujitsu is the first one. Jiu-jitsu is key because 
a well-versed boxer versus a well-versed jiu-jitsu fighter is going to lose to the jiu-jitsu fight every single time in, a, in an MMA fight, every single time. Um, a well-versed boxer with good wrestling against a really good jiu-jitsu guy, I'd put my money on the boxer, you know? Mm. But I think the grappling is the key one. A bit, probably wrestling and, and, and jiu-jitsu are a key one because we've got some, you know, I've, I've been to some shows where you've got an elite level grappler against a kid that's probably white or blue belt level grappling, but the black belt has not been able to put that person on their back during the entire fight and has got TKO'd. Mm. So re- wrestling is probably the key one because you can dictate the fight, whether that's keeping it on the feet or, or taking it down. But I, I always think jujitsu is a good one just for you to get an understanding of positions, understanding and being in, in a bad a bad environment without the fear of getting punched in the face as well, you know. Um, so you can learn how to defend a mount, learn how to defend side control, learn how to pull off a sweep without the, the worries of getting thumped at the same time. So yeah, jujitsu and wrestling are the key ones for me to start off. Okay, jujitsu wrestling. That's a note to work on my wrestling more. <laughs> Yeah, need to, need to yeah and again, even in jujitsu, even in pure jujitsu, John, it's, it's all well and good you having a, 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 a great game off your back, but all you need is somebody that's got a good, you know, you, you, if somebody takes you down and they stole you out, they've scored the two points. Mm-hmm. Well, the takedown is key, whether it's jujitsu, because it's the first score on the door. You know, if I double leg you and I put you on your back, you're two nil down and now you've got to work. You've got to chase the fight. So that, that's been my mindset on it. And also gets you into good habits for a real, a real fight situation in a self-defense scenario and also good habits for MMA. Yeah, I, I really like the emphasis on wrestling in the gym that we have. Obviously, wrestling has to be there because it's an MMA gym as well. But um, I trained at one other jiu-jitsu gym and there was like no takedowns, no wrestling and uh, I, I can see that sometimes people are adding kind of wrestling techniques into the jujitsu. Again, it's kind of becoming this like yeah, of course, mix yeah. of things, which is really cool. Really awesome to see. Um, I'm a, a dad to, I got a baby who's a year and a half old. I, I see a son. I see in the gym this amazing thing where dads are bringing their kids into the gym. They're training. There are some absolute amazing young students yeah. there. Um, how do you think, uh, like, a, as a father, you could approach bringing your kid into martial arts in a way that doesn't kind of like scare them away from it? Again, I think jujitsu is the best one. There's no, you know, nobody's getting punched or kicked. Um, you know, it's a bit of fun. You learn, you, you learn good positional awareness, learn some submissions, um, builds confidence. But a key one for me, and and again, this is experiences as a young youngster in the judo days where I didn't enjoy the competition. I don't make any of the kids do competitions mm. because for kids, it should be about training up, enjoying it um, and learning, learning something beneficial to them. I've seen so many parents push a kid into doing a competition and then they stood there in front of 300 people, they get thrown, they get submitted. It ruins their confidence. Now, is it a need for kids of, eight, nine, 10 years of age really needed to, to learn about competition at the moment? No. Put them in that environment in the gym where it becomes normal to grapple, it becomes normal to do a bit of striking, and then the competition will just will just carry on. You look at some of the older, like, like um, Johan Thomas is a perfect example, you know. He's been doing it all his life, hence why he's such a brilliant competitor. He doesn't feel the nerves. He's not been rushed into doing it. He's done it step by step. Um, Whereas, you know, your one could have been thrown into a competition, got absolutely annihilated in his first couple of weeks, and we'd have never seen him in the gym again. Mm-hmm. I really believe this, there's lots of people out there in the world who maybe have the potential to become a world champion that are not training the world because of their first experience of being pushed into a competition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. So, and, and for kids in particular, let, let the kids come in and enjoy it. It's about having a bit of fun. I, I award belts to kids that I'm not, a, you know, that have never competed. Because there's so many belts in the in the belt system, it, 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 it's it's a reward for them putting in the training, turning up two three times a week for 12 months, and they get a belt at the end of the year. Um, don't worry, at a higher level when they're a bit older, I'll encourage a bit of competition, um, but at the same time, I wouldn't enforce it. Not not for for kids. I, I don't think it's right. Jiu-jitsu, make it fun. 
all about learning, not pushing them into competition. Yeah. Maybe stepping. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Like um, so continue on the, on the story. How did, how did we get uh, to where we are now? Like what were the steps um, building on uh, the, the second gym that you went into? I, I think it was a case of when, when we first um, started the gym, it was a case of us being very, very active on the competition scene. Um, Again, lessons learned. I prob- there's probably a few lads that I, I, I pushed a little bit too quickly into, into an MMA fight. And again, that was just my inexperience as a coach. But what we did do, there was a period for about three years, John, where I was out of the house three weekends in four, either at a jiu-jitsu competition or at an MMA event, cornering all the, all, all the guys. And what we did then, we built up a fantastic reputation. You know, some of the bigger shows started calling. So I had... Um, Cage Warriors come, come to me and you know we'd like to get some of your fighters you've got a good reputation same with Bama at the time Martin and Jack went on to become a champion at Bama um, but it was it, it's the same for any you know any anybody who was starting their own club I'd say right get on the domestic circuit get yourself a good reputation make sure your fighters turn up they compete they, they're able to compete they're on weight um, act professionally you know don't, 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 don't be an idiot when you're, when you're on the scene uh, and as your your reputation grows, the the, the better level of uh, of event will come looking for you then. And again, what happens is if you know if I took a team of four five fighters to a show in Newport and we came away with five wins, there's an audience there of say I don't know eight eight hundred people. You're gonna pick up people go. Do you know I fancy doing that. That looked good. They they were a good team. That's really combat. They come away with five wins. Mm-hmm. And then people join the club, and that's how the club the club grows. Then, but again, key to being when these when these people come through the door, you treat them the same as the established pros. You you don't treat them any different. So you were just really really active, um, cornering. There was a lot of uh, that the fighters were fighting, competing regularly. Um, so the, the situation now is, you now have a, a state of the art, world class gym. Um, and is this the the fourth gym you've had? So like you've the fourth. Yeah, fourth. So fourth. we had the cellar, we had the unit on the end of where we are now, the gym in Blaina, and the, and then obviously the unit we were at. It must be like, how does it feel like uh, you know on opening day uh, when you open this gym, knowing? Yeah, you, it, it, you know, really really proud as well. You know, it's um it's been twelve years in the making. You know, I say to everybody. We've had no help off anybody. Nobody's. We've had no no government funding, no council funding, no multi-billionaire sponsors like some of these gyms in the big cities have. And we we created um, world champions on Cage Warriors, champions on Bama, USC fighters, all from this group of twelve, which originally started in a eight by four meter cellar. So the the, the key is, is is hard work self-belief and keep going just keep going because there's been times when i thought oh, i can't keep doing this but the bigger picture is like I, I had a vision of us getting a fighter into the ufc you know with brett on board now we've now got three fighters in the in the ufc and for a small gym that comes from an area with a, a population of around about eighteen thousand people it's, it's mind-blowing it's absolutely mind-blowing it is, it's like for, for people who don't know the area and the kind of culture here, it is really is mind blowing. Uh, like what's been achieved here. It really is. It's like getting three footballers into the Premier League from Abu Dhabi. Yeah. You know, it, it is, you know, and yeah. that, that's the reality. And I think sometimes probably the local people don't really appreciate how big a, how big a deal it actually is, you know, because mm-hmm. they don't really have the understanding with as if, if I was a local football team, <coughs> And I put three players on to the finally signed and joined Manchester United. They'd be saying, Crikey, they're doing something down there. But, um, you know, what I will say about the local community, they have got behind this. The, the support, like, you know, the two, the two Jacks get is, is unreal. And not just those, the likes of Edwards, Josh Reed, they all got good followings because the local community comes out and supports them. And I get a sense as well that really, even though it's, it's incredible the journey that's led to this moment, this is actually just, it feels like the beginning. It doesn't feel yeah. like it feels like this is now when things are starting to ramp up even more. It's about um, not being stale, isn't it, and 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 not resting on resting on your laurels. It's a case of uh, you achieve one thing, you set your sights on something else. So, 
for me, it was always um, get somebody on one of the on one of the bigger shows, the Bama or the Cage Warriors. We achieved that. Then it was let's get a team of fighters on here. Cage Warriors in particular. I've ended up having five pros on one one card, you know, which is up there with any team in in, in Europe, let alone just the UK, to have that many established pro fighters on there. Then it was right. Let's see if we can get a world champion. We've achieved that twice. Um, then it was a dream of let right. Let's get somebody into the UFC. Then let's try and get another fighter into the UFC. Now the the goal for me, particularly with with with, with Jack Shaw, is you know in a couple of years. We, we are setting our sights on that belt. Do you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. we're setting the bar high. We've now got a, as you said, a facility, a state-of-the-art facility. But more importantly, I think we got an elite-level coaching set up there now. We've got Crew Heem, who, let's be honest, could slot into any team in, in the world, I believe, mm-hmm. as a, as a multi coach. He's that experienced um, and, and he's, he's that good. We've got Carl Parker, who's wrestling for MMA is as good as anything I've ever... And I've been around a long time and I've been... The detail he puts into wrestling specifically for MMA is there on a and and that's shown where we're out wrestling everybody with the with the top tier guys, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I just believe our MMA and our jiu-jitsu uh, again is, is proven to be up there with anybody else. I'm not the British champion. You know, last year Leon was Leon Hins was the uh, the number one in Europe for his division at Pearl about, you know. So we're doing something right. We're doing something right. Yeah. So the, you, you definitely are doing something right. Do you, do you know exactly what that is? Do you think it's more just like you, you just experience and intuition? Over I just years? think it's more experience. And, and, and what I've done as well is a lot of, a lot of coaches out there with ego. Mm-hmm. So I took the fighters to a certain level on my own. Then it was like, we need to get somebody with um, a really good striking background. in. hence we had um, crew Hema before that we had a Brazilian lad in, um, who was a multi expert? Uh, and then asked Carl to come in and give me a hand with the MMA and with the, the the wrestling because even though we had a good wrestling base, I knew he would take it up a, up a notch to another level. So I think it's key for any anyone that's running their own club that is is key not to rest on your laurels. And if you can improve a certain area by bringing a coach in, you know, don't be afraid to do that. You know, we've got a strength and conditioning area now. We've got a full time um, PT that will do strength and conditioning for the fighters. Curtis Hale is working with quite a few of the lads in now in the gym as well. So under one roof now, we've got absolutely everything. You know, your strength and conditioning, your cardio and weights area, we've got a sauna, we've got a, a, a specialist Thai coach, we've got a specialist wrestling coach, a specialist jiu-jitsu coach, and a specialist MMA coaching team as well. So that's why the success has come. I think it's been um, a case of finding out what works, what doesn't work over the years, and a bit of trial and error, I suppose, over the over the past 12 years, and we're finally in a place now where I'm confident of, of, of our coaching team being put up against anybody now in Europe, if not the world, if I'm honest. Yeah, that, that's definitely a sense that I get of just the feeling being in the gym. It just does feel like this is something magic is happening, you know? It's, yeah. it's a really yeah, unique feeling. That. So what's the... Like so, that that's an incredible journey. What's what's the the future look like? Obviously, when this, hopefully in a couple of months now, the the virus situation is over. What's next? I think we just pick up where we where we left off. Um, we're gonna need eight ten weeks to get the fighters back into into peak condition again. So, you know, I'd like to think that by June this is all blown over and we're back in the gym, and then we probably be looking June, July, September you know, for, for, for the competition scene for both the jiu-jitsu and the MMA boys. So I know Cage Warriors have said they're going to wait wait for um, confirmation of the government when this is all lifted. And they'll start putting shows on eight weeks after that. So great. Um, we should have a few involved in that. Exciting times. Um, yeah, I'm super excited to, to get back to it, be missing it. As yeah, we all have it, don't we? Yeah. Stu Cree. Who would have thought that a, a group of grown men rolling around on the floor uh, would be such <laughs> such a part-time hobby that we miss it so much. It's something not right in the world. It's <laughs> We're a strange breed as, uh, as grapplers. Um, yeah, so I just want to thank you. Um, really loved hearing, hearing the story. It's super inspiring. Um, I've taken away a lot that I'm going to be thinking about. Um, especially, I, I really like your emphasis on like leading by example, like sticking through it, persevering. 
coaching without ego as well. Um, yeah. I think that's like really, really huge. I, I really get a sense of that when, when you're in the gym, you shake everyone's hand, you say hello to everyone at all levels, which is just makes me feel super comfortable. So, and, and, and talking about coaching with no ego as well, I think it's important that instructors are rolling with the, with their students, you know, um, I've traveled around the world and I've visited gyms all over the world and, um, I've never, ever not gone into a gym and, 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 um, and sparred and, and, and rolled. And the biggest, the biggest confident for like people go, ah, oh, you know, um, a lot, a lot of old school instructors are not rolling with their students, you know, because probably the ego says they don't want to get caught. The biggest compliment I can have is if, if you submit me, that's the biggest compliment I can have. I think, well, I've taught this lad, I've taught this lad now to be so efficient in this particular um, area of jujitsu that he's caught me with a submission on it. I don't take that as, oh my God, I've been submitted by John. You know, it's, it's a case of, I should take that as a compliment. And, and, and that should be the mindset of all, all coaches and all instructors. That the biggest compliment you can have is your student eventually catching you with a submission. I mean, mm-hmm. bloody hell, like, like Jack's been training with me all my life and he gives me a terrible time now. I'm under no illusions. He's a full-time athlete. He's, he's 25 years of age. He's training three times a day. I'm a 48-year-old old man. I can't compete on his level, but I, I'm still willing to put myself out there and still jump in and have a go, you know? Um, same as like someone like Jamie Lowe, who's a 30-odd-year-old, 110-kilogram black belt, you know? Mm. It's not pleasant under, underneath Jamie, you know what I mean? But I still put myself through it because... I'm, 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 even now I'm still trying to learn and try and work out certain positions. So roll without ego as a coach is the best advice I can give any coaches and, and don't be afraid of getting submitted. You know, it's training at the end of the day. You should be putting yourself in bad positions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love it. Well, um, I think uh, we can, we've been going for over an hour, so we can, we can wrap up there. I thought that was, that was awesome. <laughs> right. Oh, John, nice to chat you buddy. And, um, Hopefully we see each other very, very soon, pal.